All righty then, that is all the reading. It's now time for me to introduce our speaker. Uh, Rick comes to us from West Chicago, even though he looks like he's in Hawaii. He's really in West Chicago. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your story, Rick. So come on. Thank you so much for showing up tonight. Recording in progress. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks, Eric, for your service and being here and having this meeting. And, 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 and I'm glad I'm able to speak tonight. I am uh, I'm blessed with sobriety many, 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 many 24 hours of sobriety. Uh, I forgot to ask if there's a theme to my share. Uh, uh, is it? Not really. It's just a... Uh, okay. So with what I do is um, what what it was like, what happened, and what it was like now. And I, I, I try to stay really brief with what it was like because like the old TV show used to say, um, the name should change, but you know, the stories are the same. I, I, when I came in here, uh, you know, I, I stayed because I, I kept hearing people telling my stories. I, I heard, you know, I heard a pregnant woman tell my story. I heard an old time deacon tell my story. I heard um, a black man tell my story. I heard uh, friend, you know, people that I made friends with, you know, they're telling my story. And my story was, I lived fast and, and I lived in the fast lane. When, when uh, uh, I started drinking very young, I wasn't even in my teens yet. And uh, that, uh, there was no question looking back that I was an alcoholic that I am in where I was an alcoholic then because once I tasted that that uh, hard liquor whiskey I was pretty much of a hard hard liquor drinker all the time uh, um I the craving began I swear the craving began and I looked for it and I searched for it 12 13 years old 14 years old if you're going to have liquor somewhere I was going to be there and guess what I, I got enabled a little bit by, by, well, I didn't think they knew what they were doing. They didn't know what they were doing. They were putting a 13, 14 year old in charge of the bar, making the adults the drinks. And uh, back in, back then, Granny, Granny bought the cheap early times and uh, whatever that one was that they used for the screwdrivers, I can't remember, but and I was at the bar making the drinks for the grown-ups and um, taking my share, definitely taking my share. I loved it. And I uh, um, uh, moved on to 16. I'm in high school and I meet a guy. Oh, oh yeah, we were 16. And I meet a guy and this is, I mean, this still tickles me to this day. This guy, my best friend was this any Irish guy with the baby faced Irish guy, baby faced Irish guy. He had a fake ID that said he was 35 years old and he, he went into the liquor store and he bought us liquor. And that's, that's when my daily drinking began. Um, during that period, I can count more days, uh, not drinking that then I could count the numerous days of drinking. That's what we did every day. Um, we, uh, we left school, we left high school and, um, uh, the liquor store was on the way to my house where he could go and he walked in and eventually it came to, uh, they didn't even car to me. And, and it was fine with me. I didn't, I didn't. So, so then I tried to escape my my wicked ways i was uh, in parochial school so you know i was a bad boy you know i'm not you know, i'm not supposed to drink i was supposed to use several of the other things that i was doing so i thought well i'll i'll leave here and i'll go to college so i left town and i went i went downstate 
at college, Don State, Illinois, at college. And I thought, I've got, you know, this is it. I've got a clean slate. And I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they call that a geographical move. Um, I, I didn't make it. I didn't make it the first day. My parents left. My roommate had already made a connection to um, find somebody to get us liquor. And that, you know, after dinner time, we had, we had liquor. You know, we had money, and we had liquor. And uh, the daily drinking continued. Um, it was, it was not, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I say daily drinking, that's putting it mildly. It was a daily drunk. It was a daily drunk. And I was drunk every day. And I was drunk every day in college for the next 18 months. And my grade point average went from a 4.5 to being a good student to a 0.5 where they sent, <clears throat> they sent me a letter at home not to come back. And that was, that was rough. But it wasn't, it wasn't a sign to me. It wasn't a sign to me. That year I turned 19. Um, I, uh, I was doing, I was doing, I was drinking, 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 turned 19. And when I turned 19, uh, they had, they had a law in Illinois, you could still buy liquor at 19. And then um, at New Year's, it changed to 21. That didn't stop me. I still had my best friend. He still, you know, he still had his ID. And then, you know, we were 21. And we all, all, we all got a, my, my friend, myself, um, we got this uh, job at this company. Um, it was uh, IT, you know, it was, um, it was the early, the early days of um, data communications in the eighties. And we, um, and we all got jobs there. We all got jobs there and uh, things really, really took off. Now I'm only going to talk about drugs as they relate to my my drinking, because that's really all drugs did for me. Um, I I took drugs to drink more, and I smoked drugs to recover from the drinking that I did previously. And it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't always the night before. It was the night before and the next morning sometimes into the later mornings. Um, so that was my life. I was living in the fast lane. I was working in, you know, data communications was very hot. It was taking off. People were making a lot of money and we were working real hard and we were partying real hard. We had a, uh, we had a really classy, um, really classy company. Um, we would have, they called them quarterly. So it was supposed to be a quarterly meeting update. And it was a drunk fest. It was everybody from the company and drinks were free and food was free. And that, that was something I looked forward to every three months. It's like the big party. So that was my life up until, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was, that's, it was a mess. You know, anybody ever asks me about the eighties, there's, there's things I, I still can't remember about what happened, what I did, and who I was with. A lot of different people I was with during the 80s, and I was young. I was in my 20s. It was fun. I was having a good time. And then shit started to happen. Oh, uh, excuse the language. And I started going in and out of the hospital for different health reasons. Nobody ever said, well, you know, maybe this is related to your drinking or how much do you drink or what have you. And um, I also, um, I also drank with my cousin, my cousins, my cousin and his wife, but his wife was my, my drinking buddy. He was a cop. So, you know, um, I would go over there and we'd see each other and then, um, I would drink with her, or the three of us would drink together. It was a lot, that was a lot of weekends. 
that's a lot of time that I, that's how I spend my weekends is, so, um, you know, each of us, we get a case of beer. And they weren't hard, they weren't hard liquor drinkers. So we drink beer, but, um, that was a long, that was a lot of my weekends, um, uh, towards the end of the eighties is, uh, just, that was it every day, every day I drank, you know, uh, but even at the company, I drank at lunchtime because I had in the beginning, I had this job where I was a purchasing agent and purchasing agents get a lot of perks, especially back then there was no kind of limitation or conditions on what you could do. And the salespeople loved me and we had established accounts and, and they gave me a lot of liquor. I had a lot of hard liquor. The, those guys knew, those guys and gals knew what I liked to drink. And um, they took me out a lot. I went and out to a lot of liquor lunches, a lot of drunk lunches. So that was my life. And it looked pretty. And I had a pretty life. I had a nice apartment. I had a great job, an enviable job, because I was in data processing and you know, a pretty car. And I had, I wouldn't say I had a lot of money, but I was comfortable for somebody in their 20s. So I was really comfortable. But then, like I said before, things started going on. So first there was the um, the uh, trips to the hospital, back and forth to the hospital. And uh, then there was blackouts. Now, I had had blackouts before, but then these blackouts came more frequently. And I still, you know, I still did not associate any of this with drinking, with my drinking. And, um, yeah, that was our life at home too. It's like the refrigerator was full. I had a special cabinet where I kept my, I, uh, my, uh, Murphy's Irish whiskey. I kept that in a special cabinet. Not that anybody would take it because my friends didn't drink hard liquor. I drank the hard liquor and they were beer drinkers. So we always had beers in the fridge, you know, and our apartment was the party apartment. So that, that was my life. That was my life. I was working and I was partying. That was it. And um, so the blackouts came and I would find myself blacked out in some pretty precarious places. One time, I'll never forget this, I don't think. I keep talking about it. I, I blacked out in, in the bathroom, in the bathroom in my apartment. I blacked out and... Um, I couldn't get out and there was nobody home. I couldn't get out. I couldn't get out of the bathroom. The lights were off. I couldn't find the light switch. So, and still, I didn't have a problem. I didn't have a problem. But then I started noticing things like, um, I would take Tylenol like four or five times a day for headaches. And that was the problem. The Tylenol, the, 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 Excessive time use was the problem. And I talked about my cousin before, and uh, this was about six months before the end of my drinking. She disappeared, and everybody was up in arms in the family, and we didn't know where she went. She was gone, and about three days later, um, some friends of hers that she met that were in the program um, brought her car back to my to my cousin. And she had been in treatment at Grant Hospital, which was a pretty big treatment center back then. And um, that was like, I think that was the epiphany, you know, because she did, she, as far as I knew, she by far didn't drink as much as I did. But then I started thinking, well, that's, that. I just didn't notice <laughs> and she was drinking as much or more than I was because I was right along with her. You know, when, when we were hanging out, I was, you know, was keeping up with her. She was keeping up with me and whatever. So when that happened, and, um, then uh, she got out of treatment. And uh, I remember this night before sobriety. Um, she had these people over. They, they invited me to this party and there wasn't going to be any liquor. And because, you know, we didn't want liquor around since she was out of treatment. But um, these folks 
there's about there's seven seven or eight of us and uh, these folks were out of treatment and they were going to AA and they were the jolliest they were the funniest they were they were just my cousin was she had so so much joy in her life and I was there and it was August and I was sitting in a rocking chair in the corner in my wool sweater and uh I was just looking at you know part of me was like looking at them like they were crazy and then another part of me was like well you know how can I be like that and uh if it meant going to treatment I wasn't going to get it because I, I I abhorred the idea of going to treatment I had friends who went to treatment and uh, back then the insurance company would pay for 28 days and uh I just had I had no desire no desire to go and um so some time went by and I can't really recall I oh yeah I remember what happened it was a Wednesday afternoon and I was off of work and uh, I live in I lived on the third floor of the the apartment building there was only three floors but um and uh the Tylenol the Tylenol thing came on and I was like I'm just gonna go out on the balcony and jump off the bell and not thinking that through very well because I probably wouldn't have ended up dead and the other thought came to me that I would call AA. So I did. I called AA and talked to this woman. Now I lived, I lived at that time. I lived in a little town called Carroll Stream, and it was very urban back in the 1988, 1987. And she was downtown, and she said. She was like talking me through it, and she's like, you know what? We can't get you to a meeting until Friday night. And I was like, and she's like, can you can you hold out till then? And I'm like, yeah, I guess so. I'm going to go to a psychiatrist and talk to him on Friday. And um, yeah, I don't know what was going on that day, but I just, you know, I just did whatever she said. And then I went. I walked into my first meeting and I was like, you guys, I never felt this before in my life and I haven't felt it since, but I was walking into this meeting. It was at, um, it was at Glen Oaks Hospital and um, I started to turn around to leave. I was like, this isn't going to work out and this isn't for me. And I felt a push. I felt a push. It could have been, it could have been a breeze, but it was not a breezy day. I felt a push and I was, I was turned around. I mean, I was physically turned around. I didn't, I didn't do it myself. This is my, um, this is my momentary white light experience. This is the only white light experience I've ever had. And it didn't last very long, but I, I did go in and I did go in and I asked for help. And, um, I went to that first meeting and, uh, my friend, my friend Gary was there and uh, Gary and I used to party together because we went to college together and he left. He left early. I didn't see him. Um, so he ended up being my first sponsor in AA and um, that guy helped me a lot. I really learned a lot. He's still a member of AA. He's still going strong. And um I learned a lot about myself and I learned how to be honest. I think I said earlier, I, I start, I stopped telling lies when I got to AA and uh, yeah. So I start going to meetings. I worked second shift. I went to meetings at 9 a.m. every morning. I went with old timers and they yelled at me and they were crabby. And, and uh, uh, I saw a lot of people come in that were, um, like the book describes last gaspers and um, I had this old guy Ray and he would sit there and he would smoke his Chesterfields and he would yell at me and he'd be crabby and he'd say you know what be glad that's not you 
you know, and he would say that online. I, I, I drank more than you spilled on the floor or whatever that line is. And uh, so I stuck around. I stuck around and I had, I got uh, four years sober and I moved to the city and I was going to live a life and back in data processing. And um, I took this guy home and I smoked some pot. Now, some people say, like, I, I even had a sponsor that explained you know, he walked me through this. Some people say that's not a slip, but it's it's a slip. It was a slip for me because I had the thinking of, I had the relapse thinking. So um, I didn't tell anybody for a year. I went back to meetings the next day. And I didn't tell anybody that I did that for like a year. And then I got a new sponsor who was, um, he was hardline. He was hardline AA, right down the line. I, he was my sponsor for nine years. Uh, he tortured me. He uh, taught me, taught me about the book, word for word about the book. And uh, that was, that was life, you know, that was, that was how I, needed to live my life and that's how I lived my life and uh, my life changed a lot you know I left that field I um and I got fired from a couple of jobs I never got fired when I was drinking and those were blessings in disguise um so I always look for those um so then um yeah after my sponsor got cancer. That was pretty heavy for all of us. And my life took another turn. And um, I was, I was doing it, you know, I was working, it's working, working, but I had like, I guess when he got sick, I had 10 or 12 years of sobriety under my belt and um, life took another turn. And uh, I found another job. And so I was driving from the city to Schaumburg, which if you've ever been to Illinois, Schaumburg is where the big mall is. And uh, it's uh, called the extension of, of Chicago. And so I was driving from the city to Schaumburg. And I did that for five and a half, six and a half years. Um, that was like, that was the highlight of my career. And I was crazy. Because my life consisted of um, going to work. It was still the it was still the telecommunications. Um, going to work, going to school, and going to AA. sleep. Sleep was a luxury, and um, eating and anything else was uh, pretty much by the seat of my pants. There was no partying. There was no going out. There was no extracurricular activities in the A, and I, I couldn't do service work. And then finally, I graduated, and um, uh, things, I want to say things got better, but I still had, you know, I still had problems. You know, there was a lot of things that I ignored while I was going to college and working full time. And, um, and uh, so, so I graduated and I thought, okay, well now I can live my life. But um, I had to address these uh, shortcomings and I had to really dig into the steps and get up to, you know, where I was working the shortcomings. And one thing I wanted to say is today, today's theme is, is about service because um, this is my third meeting today. And um, I, attended those other meetings, they have service responsibilities there. But the first meeting we talked about service and the 12th step and uh, and how it ties in with our insanity. And uh, uh, Nooner's meeting, we talked about 10, 11, and 12. And then today I'm here to share, you know, my experience, strength of hope. And um, that's what I have. That's what I was given. I didn't have. You know, I didn't have any hope. I was, I was, we talked about it this afternoon. What was the word I, um, you know, I was hopeless. I was, uh, 
Yeah, I was, I was the idiot that was going to jump off the third floor and you know, to try and kill himself. I had no, I had nothing. You know, I had nothing. I, my life looked really pretty, but I, I had nothing. I had, and I got, and I look at that today and I'm like, I'm so, I'm so lucky. I'm so blessed to have what I have. And I don't, I'm, I'm a minimalist. I don't have like a lot of material things, but I have really great people in my life. And, uh, I'm very, uh, gregarious. So I, and I love to have people in my life and, and, and the majority, I say the majority of the people that I have in my life are so good people. And, uh, it's great. I mean, um, I have changed in the face of um, society saying people don't change. I have seen others change. I have seen others get well. I have seen a lot of tragedy in this, in this, uh, in this, while I was in sobriety, while I was in this program, my, my best friend, um, uh, many years ago, um, my best friend, Martin, went to work at his family's business and uh, there was an employee that had a beef with him and um, the guy shot him in the head. And I was like, I was, I was numb. I, you know, I, I couldn't talk to anybody, but I, I, I still had, you know, I still had HP. I still had the higher power going on and uh, you know, I didn't drink over it. I didn't drink over my brother. My brother also died. He was a young man, 35 years old. And, uh, and I, that was a hard one. I, I stayed sober, but I also stayed in bed for six days. But during that time, I had people calling me and, um, I think where I lived, I had one sober friend that lived in my, oh yeah, my landlord. Uh, the building manager, he was, he was sober. And, um, so he was there, you know, during that time, but, um, I stayed sober, you know, it's, it's life on life's terms these days. I'm not always happy about it. I blame God a lot. I, I question God a lot. I'm like, you know, is this your will for me? Really? And, uh, and that's the struggle I go through these days is, uh, you know, sometimes things happen and, and I'm like, um, blindsided. And, uh, I think, you know, this can't be, but then I've learned, you know, I've learned here that sometimes these things are blessings in disguise. These things are, and my friend, Joey, uh, 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 he, he always used to say, um, or he still does probably, he hasn't gone anywhere. He always used to say, um, now it slipped my mind. It was, it's the great saying. It's all, oh, <laughs> when I have plans, God, God has other ideas. And, uh, I, that's something that's true. Very true for me. Um, so I'm, I'm wary about making any kind of life changes without you know, consulting somebody and praying about it. There's a lot of prayer. Now, I'm not a hundred percent. Um, I'm not a hundred percent convinced about prayer, but, um, I, I also believe that, um, I haven't got anything to lose by saying a prayer. I haven't got anything to lose by saying a prayer. Um, maybe some, maybe a breath, maybe a couple of seconds. But, um, you know, I, I, and I've even tried to get away from it. And that's when everybody's praying, you know, pray, pray about this and we're going to pray for you. And, uh, yeah. So that's just a fraction. I'm a, do I, am I have a time or? You can go to the top of the hour, Rick. Oh, 20 more minutes? Yeah. Or I whenever, start all over again. Uh, whenever you're through, whatever, it's okay. All right, all right. 
well, um, and yeah, I'll just talk about what's hap what's happened these days is um, for the past, I want to say nine months, but it's probably longer than that. I have had some serious health issues where I, I can still function. I was still functioning, but um, I was not a happy camper. And I was, I really was mentally, uh, mentally and physically uh, uh, weakened by these things. My back, my back was giving me so much trouble. And I went to physical therapy. I'm in physical therapy now. And it's gotten better. It's gotten a lot better. And, and this is probably where prayer comes in and, and my discussions with God about, uh, you know, is this your will for me? Yeah. Because now I'm a, I'm a retired man and I live out in the country. And as far as my city folk friends are concerned. Um, and uh, yeah, this is God saying, you know, you got to slow down. You know, you're retired. You don't have, you, you don't have to work. But my last job, I retired in 2021 and I worked at O'Hare. And to me, it was just, I took it for granted. It was, I just rolled with it. It was no big deal. And uh, we made good money. But then COVID came along and uh, I was at O'Hare on Friday the 13th of March. And uh, it was a normal day. And I went to work on Monday the 16th and it was not a normal day. It was uh, a ghost town. Mm, I still get choked up thinking about it because all my friends are out of work. All the people that I, my colleagues, when I call them colleagues, I mean, we threw luggage around and we showed people where to go. They all had families, a lot of, a lot of them were, a lot of them were um, uh, immigrant people from Europe and Mexico and uh, all over the place. And they had big families and nobody was working. There was no work, there was no money, nobody was coming through the doors. And it's just like they say, they're not coming through the doors and spending their money. There's no business. And to think that um, that could happen at an airport like O'Hare is, uh, yeah, I used to go, I still worked, but I, I was making significantly, I was only making pocket change in the end. And uh, I would go there and I would leave and I'd be so depressed and I get treated for depression, but I'd be so depressed about thinking about all those others. I mean, thousands and thousands of people work at that place on a daily basis, but I didn't drink over it. And I was able to go and attend meetings and um, pray and uh, we, we survived. We made it through. There were a lot of people that I knew in sobriety that they couldn't, they couldn't make it through. And uh, it was another blessing. And so out of that came a lot of help. Um, I think partly, I think partly my retirement came out of the health issues that my back and my migraines got, my migraines got a, a lot worse. Um, to the point where I had never really been on a prescription migraine medication before, but at that time in 2020, 2021, um, my doctor prescribed me with a prescription migraine medication. Um, I actually, I said that I misspoke. I had been on, <laughs> I had had migraines pretty bad towards the end of my uh, telecommunications career. And I, my doctor put me on this great drug. This drug was designed for um, women who had um, severe menstrual problems, but it also worked miracles on migraines. However, some women died from taking it, so they took it off the market. So, so from that time till 2020, I didn't have any. I'm trying to remember why I got off on this tangent. Oh, it's just a health issue. 
my grades are pretty serious. I never, I never took it like that. I mean, it was just sort of a state of, of being until the medication came on. I got through all that. You know, I got, I got through all that. I still attend. Thank God for Zoom. That was my, when, when uh, COVID took us into lockdown, that was my number, my first fear, my first question was, how will I, how will I, how will we have meetings? I, 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 I couldn't fathom. That, that, that upset me. I was pretty upset about that. You know? How are we going to have meetings? How are we going to go to meetings if everybody has to stay at home or apart? I didn't even know about Zoom. But my friends were like, oh, yeah. We have all these Zoom meetings set up. And I was like, oh, that's great. And um, and so that's what I started to do during the pandemic is I started Zoom meetings, going to Zoom meetings, and a lot of them. And I was really uh, I was pleased. I was surprised that that was sort of an answer to a prayer, an unanswered prayer, is how I'm going to have meetings. Um, Shortly after that, I saw a meme um, on the internet on some some one of the one of the streaming services, and it was uh, a meme about who caused the pandemic. And the the drawing had a man uh, a man a figure with a mask on, and then he pulls his mask off, and it's the Zoom logo. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, that's what happened. So. Um, so that's what I do now. Mostly, uh, yeah, all my meetings. I've tried to attend some face-to-face -face meetings. And uh, <laughs> the last face-to-face -face meeting I attended was about a, six weeks ago. A fight broke out. So two guys were in. You know, it was a men's, uh, it was, they, they split up men and women. And it was the men's group. and. Uh, yeah, some a fight broke out. I mean, not fists, not fists, just shouting and you did this and you shouldn't say that. And, and I was like, oh, so okay, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> I don't like this. So we don't have too many. Um, I mean, we have a club here, but I don't, I don't go there anymore. I used to do a lot of service there, but um. Uh, they uh, glum. They became very glum, and 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 it it reflected on me. And another thing that happened was there was a lot of apathy about service there, and um, that started reflecting on me. And where I got to the point where I didn't want to do service there anymore. So um, that wasn't good for me. So. I picked up some other meetings. I go to a, I go to a daily Nooners meeting, which is just fantastic. I'm their treasurer, um, and uh, we have a really good group of really close knit, and we don't pull any punches either. You know, we may like each other, but nobody's getting away with anything. And we have we have one guy that's been in the program for eons, and uh, he is not a bleeding deacon, but he will definitely, if, if something is done incorrectly, he will definitely um, point it out to you in a gracious way. But um, So I'm really grateful for that meeting. And then I go to another 12-step program that, that's a daily meeting too, but um, uh, I don't go every day. I can't, I can't, I try, I try. And uh, my sponsor from that group is here today, too. So, hey, Derek's a heavy dentist. Um, so, I don't know, you guys, I've talked your ears off, and um, I pretty much said what's going on. And uh, I do want to say that uh, this year I celebrated 32 years of sobriety when um, that's half my life. And... Uh, when I was, when I believed that 
I wasn't going to, let's see, I was 28, 27, 28 when I got in here. And I believed I wasn't going to make it past 30 the way I, the way I lived. I drank every day. I did drugs to drink every day. I did drugs to recover every day. And um, I wasn't going to make it, not the way I was going. And plus, I had sort of chosen, you know, with suicide, um, whether it be conscious or not, it's still a choice to end your life. And it's hard. And uh, it's, it's, sometimes it can be hard to walk away. And uh, it's still, you know, I had chosen, I had chosen not to, not to go on. But then I made that phone call to that crazy lady in AA. And uh, I told her I would stick around. <laughs> so here we are. Here we are. And I'm glad to be here. And I'm glad you're all here. Because we are all miracles. Because <clears throat> I've had some couple of tra- I'm going to finish with this, I swear. But I had a couple of tragic incidents this past summer that um, involved alcohol. Um, a young man and his sister, uh, um, who he was um, best friends with my niece, but my niece and I are very, very close. I, I watched her grow up. We were, we were together most of that time, and she was growing up like sort of like a daughter, but not not my daughter because, and uh, you know, she's my niece. But this young man and her were best friends, and. Um, he and his sister were coming home from dinner with the, with their parents, and he was making a left hand turn and a severely highly intoxicated driver um, smashed into their car, front end collision. They were both killed um, on site. And then another thing that happened uh, this summer is a woman that I knew from AA and I went to meetings with her for many years and I knew her, we were good friends. And then um, she came out here and uh, she uh, she went up, she went out there again. She's drinking again. She's drinking, she's drinking heavily. You know, she went, you know, she's drinking heavily and um, she was driving home from a work function. She was intoxicated and she, uh, front end collision with, uh, a couple, um, and, and they were killed. So that was like, but for the grace of God. Right? And I'm sorry to end on such a downer, but I just have to remember these things because those situations could have very easily been me. I can't tell you the number of times I drove them. And I can't tell you how many times I should not have been drinking. I mean, I should not have. I've told you the number of times I should not have been drinking. I can't tell you the number of times I should not have been driving. And uh, so I'm just happy to be here. I'm sorry I've been such a downer, but, um, you know, we are all blessed. And I thank God for each and every one of you. And I thank God for each and every one that I go to any other 12-step meetings with. Um, This is... You know, this is the thing that's saving my life, both in Alcoholics Anonymous and Overeaters Anonymous. I mean, <laughs> I my my disease slipped out, and uh, as, soon, as soon as I tried to manage it, it slipped out into, you know, abusing food. And uh, I finally got into OA, and uh, it's because I'm in AA that I got to OA because it was my AA friend that took me to OA. So that's all I have. I swear. Thank you very much. Recording for stopped.